Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 142 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Lorraine Bellato, author of Success with Hydrangeas, all about hydrangea care and pruning. The plant profile is on St. John's Wort, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with Dr. Alan Armitage, who shares the last word on gardening with hydrangeas. This episode, we're joined by Lorraine Bellato. She is a horticulturist and author of Success with Hydrangeas. Welcome, Lorraine. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to talk about everything that makes successful gardening with hydrangeas and maybe even some of our favorite hydrangea varieties and choices, and especially aimed at the Mid-Atlantic Gardener. But before we dive into all of that, Lorraine, On the Garden DC podcast, we like to ask our guests, were they born with a green thumb and chlorophyll in their veins? That wasn't my upbringing. I am not what's known as a heritage gardener. Um, My mother would occasionally plant some pansies in the spring and maybe we'd have a basil plant or a tomato plant, but that was never part of my daily activity. Uh, Any of my growing up years, none of it, absolutely none of it. I didn't come to this until I was well into um, my 30s and 40s. And even then I was in the clutches of corporate America, so I couldn't even do much at that point. Hmm, that's fascinating because, yes, so many, the majority of our guests were either brought up in some type of gardening or agricultural background. So coming to it later in life, that is a lot of our listeners, I imagine, probably relate to that. And so how did you make that transition from corporate life to a plantaholic, as you describe <laughs> yeah, that's yourself? That's right, plantaholic. Well, <laughs> first of all, my, my background, I'm uh, my eth- I'm ethnically uh, Italian American, so I have very strong roots uh, coming from uh, Italy. And and uh, the history of Italians in this country is, in most cases, they were blue collar laborer types, and that's the jobs that they were hired into. And it's the pattern that we see with all immigration uh, in this country. And and my heritage is no different. However, because of that, the idea of me doing anything with my hands in the dirt, uh, even though I might have leaned a little bit in that way, I used to get great marks in science. And when I was in school, um, it was highly, it was highly uh, discouraged. So I went in a completely different direction. Um, And my entrance to horticulture, I think it was just one of those kind of sleeping things and eventually, when I finally um, retired, and I did retire from a corporate environment, I did what a lot of older people do in their 50s. I started to explore master gardener programs, looking at the classes. And the more I got into it, the more fascinated I became because, as you well know, gardeners are always learning. I mean, I've been a master gardener now for close to 25 years, and every season I'm heavily involved in it because. When you think you know it, you don't know anything. And the more I think I know, the more I recognize that I don't know a lot of things. And so it's the intellectual dimension that really drew me in. And then, of course, the satisfaction of success, right? I mean, you put a plant in the ground and all of a sudden you have this gorgeous flower or this wonderful scent or this great color and, and you get hooked. At least I got hooked. That's how I, that's how I got into it. And then I, it, just, it just went from that to another extreme. I worked at a garden center for 10 years, um, started to write, started to speak, you know, it just, it just kind of exploded, if you will, into the crazy uh, plant person that I am today. Mm, Fascinating. And so where were you gardening when you caught that gardening bug? Oh, I was at that point. I was in um, in uh, New York State. I was in Westchester County. We had a home, of, and we were in suburban environment, and we had a little piece of property that I was able to kind of get my hands in the dirt a little bit. But I really didn't dig into it until I got into Connecticut, because by that time I had, as I say, retired from this corporate environment um, into this 
this piece of property that's almost two acres. And I thought this is a great opportunity to really understand, learn, do, and, and get my hands dirty, literally. So that's what I did. And so I've been at that for um, the better part of 20 plus years now. Hmm. And so describe where you're gardening now, um, what the soil is like, um, your zone, maybe your average rainfall. <laughs> What did, well, before this, you well, I couldn't. You know, we used to have a normal, what I would call a normal um, series of events when it comes to weather. First of all, I'm in Connecticut. I'm on the western part of the state, practically where it meets New York. Um, we're in, we're in the hills. So if you looked at our property on the USDA zone map, you'd think that I was in a zone six. Um, but zone six plants for me become compost. They do not make it. So I'm really a zone five. We have this little microclimate. Um, the, the frost settles in. I have a lot of cold spots. Um, I have this piece of property that is varied because uh, parts of it are wet uh, and soaking wet. So I've learned to love that. And I use a lot of plants that survive and do actually do well under wet conditions. But then we have these other areas where it's very, very dry, like out by the road, where the snowplow guy drops a million pounds of dirt and sand every time we get a snowstorm. Um, you know, our, our, our climate had been always uh, cold and snowy in January, February, and March. Um, the past three winters, that hasn't been the case, with the exception of March. March uh, this year is the same as it was last year in the sense that we got uh, most of our snow and our cold temperatures. Uh, January was 13 degrees on average uh, warmer than previous years. Um, February was another 15 degrees on average warmer. Um, and I see that warmth reflected during the gardening season as well, because that carries over. I see my plants are responding entirely differently now into their um, bloom cycles when they go dormant. Um, I was out there today walking around. My garlic is actually uh, coming up. The greens of my garlic are coming up. And the soil temperature is probably around 55 degrees. Uh, normally, it's not that warm in March. We usually doesn't happen until April. So um, I have a variety of climates. I have a variety of soil conditions, uh, all the way from almost desert-like and dry and flinty to these really heavy, wet, soggy, uh, clay-like soils. And it's just everything that you can imagine. So when I'm uh, trialing hydrangeas, which I'm sure we'll talk about, or I hope we talk about, I put, I get more than one of a sample and I put it in different parts of the property to see exactly how it's going to behave under a variety of conditions. And that to me is the real test of whether or not the plant is, is worth its salt and the money that I might put down if I'm going to actually spend and buy something. Hmm. Well, let's transition right into that trialing, Lorraine. So both of us uh, are garden communicators and we know each other through GardenCom International, the Society or Association of Garden Communicators. And so we do receive some trial plants. So maybe let's start with those. Well, and, and in fact, when we don't receive the trial plants, I actually go back and I ask the growers uh, if they wouldn't mind uh, letting me experiment and sample a plant. So I get things, for example, I have a very bad case of zone envy. I would love to be able to grow things where you are, Kathy, down in, in the D.C. area in that wonderful zone seven relative to mine, which is zone five. So I will interface, for example, with the Southern Living crowd and I will ask them if I could trial a specific plant. And they're very welcoming and they're very receptive to that because they want to see if it works. So for example, um, Encore Azaleas first came out, I don't know, maybe about seven or eight years ago, and they were not uh, rated for zone six, for zone five rather, just zone six and warmer actually, more towards zone seven. And I asked if I could trial a few and they very generously sent me about six different ones. And I peppered them all around the property and I'm delighted. And I, every time I see them at the trade shows, I go back and I tell them how fabulous the Encore Azaleas have been here in zone five. And they can clearly go out to their um, to their growers and they can say that it is a, is a zone five plant. And I can name the plants that actually do well in zone five when it comes to Encore Azaleas. And that's just one example of, of how it works. Um, so I can actually try the plant. I can test it. Um, there are others that don't do so well. The, maybe the stems won't be straight or, or strong or the flowering will be lackluster, you know, and eventually um, I'll pull the plant out. Number one, I don't have room for every single plant. And so I cycle them in and cycle them out as the case, as the case changes. Um, but some of them are failures here. 
and I pull them out all the time. So it's the only way I can manage to trial as much as I can get an opportunity to play with. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned your two acres, and I was still thinking, wow, they still send me a ton of hydrangeas, and I don't have room for all of them. And you do, of course, want to do more than one plant because, you know, one plant could be defective or not gotten enough nutrients or whatever reason. So one off is not really uh, an adequate trial. But so in your two acres, you do have some room, but how long are you leaving an individual plant in the ground to evaluate it? Like three to five years? At, at, at least three years. Um, and if we have, like we had a really cold, cold, abnormally cold winter four years ago. And so I kind of write that one off and I, I, I don't count that as one of the years because when it when it's abnormally cold like that, especially when it comes to hydrangeas uh, that are so sensitive to the cold, I give them an extra year, but minimally it's about three years. And a lot depends on the size of the plant. Sometimes I'll get a plant that's a four or five gallon plant, which has a really well-established root system. And sometimes I'll get a quart plant, you know, and that, I mean, it's a very small hole. I don't have to dig a very big hole, but it doesn't, it has to, it needs a lot more to make it through the next couple, three seasons. So, so, um, I don't pull them out until at least three years. And then, of course, when I pull them out, we wind up donating them. So I'll donate them to the library or to the church, or I invite the master gardeners to come over with a shovel um, and some kind of a container. And I mark the plants off and I say, dig whatever you want to dig. They're yours for the taking. And that allows me, again, uh, extra room to put more plants in uh, for that particular season. So they don't go to waste. They don't go into the compost bin. What they do is they get recycled back out to another gardener who really wants them, which is a great way, I think, to to solve the problem of too many plants and too little room too little mm-hmm. room yeah and it also allows you to visit them in future years because i've done <laughs> i've done the same with uh, abundance of roses that i've been sent to trial and i'll give them to yep. a local monastery yep. um, and some other places that i know in you know three to five years i can go and actually go and visit them and see them in situ in their garden mm-hmm. um, if they've actually grown out of my garden all right. And, and sometimes I get so many that I can't even put them in in the current season. And so I'll parcel them out to other garden garden friends um, with the caveat that they need to come back and tell me and report back on how it's doing. So I don't give it up completely. Um, I do have a kind of a string that goes back to the plants that I give away to make sure that they, in fact, uh, check them out and take care of them and then tell me how they performed. A couple of them, a couple of the hydrangeas, for example, wound up at the Cape uh, with a friend of mine that gardens out there. And so she's been feeding me information about how they, how they work. Hmm. Uh, Lorraine, I'm thinking that you and I are about to become tremendously popular. <laughs> <laughs> well, the secret is out now about being a garden writer's friend. Um, so let's talk about some of that trialing. What are you looking for? when you are trialing a new hydrangea? Well, let me let me deal with that one, uh, talking about the different types of hydrangeas. So um, when it comes to the panicle hydrangeas, you know, the ones that have the beautiful cone-shaped flowers like limelight and firelight and some of those, those are pretty... Um, pretty foolproof because they're hardy in many cases down to zone three, zone four. So no amount of crazy pruning, uh, deer browse, um, late season storms, anything like that is going to stop them from flowering. And the pruning job on those is really simple. So what I look for on those is stem strength. You know, the flowers are so big on those that uh, they hold the water, especially when we get those summer gully washers that come through with those heavy thunderstorms. And I'm looking at stem strength on those. And I've pulled a couple out because the stem strength just wasn't there. And sometimes I don't pull them out right away. What I do is I move them. Maybe I don't, I'm not giving it enough sun and I move it to a sunnier spot when it comes to the panicle hydrangeas. And sometimes that solves the stem strength problem, which is another a data point that I then share with, um, with my audiences and, and my readers so they understand how much sun something's going to need. Um, a, a good example of that is, uh, is Wee White, which is a, but that's an arborescence, but that's one that I had to give a lot more sun than you would think it needed because when I had it in um, a little bit of shade, it would always flop over it. But as soon as I put it in a full sun environment, it stood straight up and it's a fabulous, nice, small, compact plant. And so, um, you know, the, I'm looking for stem strength when I look at both the panicle hydrangeas and the woodland hydrangeas, the arborescence. Um, you know, Annabelle is a great plant. She's been around a long time. She's part of a, many, many breeding programs, but she has weak stems. And so pruning habits are different for that plant to, to, um, 
to work with that weakness, or you can go to the newer models, if you will, and you'll go to Incredible and Invincible, and they're going to give much better stem strength, but you have to give them more sun. So I'm looking at stem strength, generally speaking, when it comes to the panicles and to the arborescence. Um, the flower color isn't as important to me, although I do make I do make note of that, especially when it comes to the panicles, because some of the newer panicles are coming up and they're uh, white, and then they're almost going immediately to a deep rose color as opposed to a pale pink color. And mm -hmm. that can be very striking in the garden. So um, color is a little bit of the equation, but not as much when it comes to the panicles and the woodland hydrangeas. Now, when it comes to the, um, uh, what I call the troublemakers, which are the big leaf hydrangeas, the macrophyllas, those are the ones for me that are the troublemakers because I am in zone five. Hmm. And so in my experience, um, I'm only going for now, I've kind of had to make a decision to go to only rebloomers. And so I'm testing reblooming capability. Uh, the ones that don't rebloom in most cases will not flower for me in a normal year. They'll just get killed by the weather over the course of the winter and then maybe the early spring fluctuations that we have. So I'm looking now at specifically rebloomers and again, what their reblooming pattern is, how quickly they turn and give me another set of flowers, how again, how strong the stem strength is. And, and when they give me that second set of flowers or third set of flowers, if they make it before my season closes. So in most cases, uh, my plants won't break dormancy until about mid-April, maybe about April 15th. And usually we get our first frost here uh, and a freeze possibly by Columbus Day, October 12th. So if my rebloomer, and if it's a tough season, many a times my rebloomer won't be able to produce that flower before the season closes and it freezes on the plant. And I have lots of frozen buds when I go back out in the spring of big leaf hydrangeas that that second burst of flowers never came through because the season closed too quickly. So I'm testing for reblooming capability in a zone five and colder zone. When I come to uh, the, the mountain hydrangeas, the serratas, those are the most fabulous plants. They are the best. They have never failed to flower for me. They are so much more resistant to weather conditions because they come from the mountains of Japan. So that genetic bloodline uh, strengthens them against, again, the, the winter weather. I can't make the deer go away. I can spray and I do try to do that to deter them. But it's mostly the winter that knocks these plants back. Um, but on the mountain hydrangeas, you don't get that. The oak leaves stand up really well. So um, they don't, and none of those are rebloomers, by the way. And the climbing hydrangeas stand up very well and none of those are rebloomers. So they're much more resistant to the cold. So I'm really about temperature and I'm really about stem strength. And then I start to add in all the other pieces, the, the, the color of the flower, the maybe the fragrance, uh, the climbing hydrangeas, a fabulously fragrant flower. And I would recommend that to anybody because it's not fussy about soil or about light or about anything. And the deer don't even, at least my deer, don't even seem to like it. So um, each of them has their own strength, depending on what the gardener wants to accomplish. If you want to create a screen, if you have sun, if you have mostly shade, if you have part shade, I think you have to first, before you put a hydrangea in, ask yourself the question, what do I want this plant to do? And then the second question is, do I have the right cultural conditions for that plant to survive and to thrive? Because surviving isn't what we want. We really want it to thrive. And so those are the first two questions I encourage people to consider when they are looking at making a, a purchase of a hydrangea. Now, you can say, well, you know, I can't buy that because it's not going to make it in my zone, this and that. Well, I have another alternative idea for you. Even if the plant you buy only flowers for the current season because you're getting it from a grower and they have been really um, bred and produced so they look wonderful in that first season. Enjoy it for the first season as if it were an annual because you're going to get so much pleasure from that plant. Even mm -hmm. if it doesn't make it through the winter time into next year, you've got a whole season of color or fragrance or whatever it is you're aiming for just by buying that one plant. And if you treat it as an annual, you won't be disappointed because you know some of them are just not going to make it. So that's another way to look at it, to kind of forgive the plant for not being able to make it in your particular area. Treat it as an annual and enjoy it while you've got it. Hmm. Yeah, that does remind me of what are the so-called florist hydrangeas uh -huh. that you would get at a floral or a plant shop as a gift. 
and meant to be enjoyed until the blooms fall off indoors. Right. Um, and then I guess you can plant them outside and take the chance. Some of them usually will do very well here for us when you do that, but they, were, they weren't bred for that. Right. They weren't bred. And they'll do great for you because you're in that nice warm zone seven. They do great on the Cape. But I, you take a florist hydrangea, you know, the one that comes out for Easter or Mother's Day or like you say over in the, in the, as a gift from the local florist, um, they look beautiful but highly unlikely that they're going to produce flowers for you. And it's, it's just also the same idea with that is just like with when you're forcing daffodils, you know, the plant has put so much energy into that flower production in a short period of time that it needs the opportunity to recharge before it can perform again and do that next set of flowers for you. So um, that's the other part of it is forcing it. You've for, you forced it. Hmm. And so that really, that really pulls a lot of energy from the plant. And most gardeners, you know, we're not, we don't, we don't put that much fertilizer in. And so we can't restore it to the same level that it might've been when you first brought it home. No. And there's other, another dirty secret about those florist hydrangeas uh, that a lot of people don't know. You know, there are these short, compact, beautiful, full of flowers. Cause so of course they've forced them and they've put a lot of nitrogen in there to get those big blooms, but they've also applied a growth inhibitor correct, um, to keep them that full uniform fit on the shelf. That's yep. the biggest phrase, right? And for retailers, it's got to yep. fit on the shelf. It's got to fit on that truck rack um, and be a nice compact plant. So once that growth inhibitor wears away, um, you're not going to get this nice, short, compact plant in your garden. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With with one exception, I would tell you the one that grows short all the time, um, doesn't have to be a florist hydrangea, is uh, the city lines. The city lines all flower on old wood, and they mm. all are short-stemmed and strong-stemmed, and they will always stay small. And that's probably the one exception to that rule. And mm-hmm. and because it it's not a rebloomer, I don't have them anymore. I tried it, and I had to yank it out of the garden because it just did not produce for me after the first year. That was it. Yeah, I have both City Line. I think it's Berlin and Paris. Mm-hmm. If I'm, yep. if I'm they're remember, gorgeous. Remember correctly, just gorgeous. They're pinks and reds. Yep. Uh, those two varieties, and they do stay nice and short and compact. I yep. have them in part shade though, so I was blaming the not reblooming on that that I had them in a little bit too much shade. Well, they don't rebloom. The City Lines are not rebloomers. Mm. They are only on old wood. Um, and they're gorgeous. And, and, and when you see them in the garden center, you know, the, when, when they're grown, you see them in the garden center and all you see, you see the little tiny container and then you see huge flowers, about six or seven in the container. And every time, and that I was working at the garden center um, for 10 years and I kept seeing them all the time and the plants would just call out to me. They would say, buy me, buy me, buy me. And so I did, I bought them um, and they were great, but only for the one season. I could not get a second season out of them. And of course they don't rebloom. So it was just a big green bush, a little green bush, and I didn't need another green bush. I have enough green bushes. I was looking for flowers at that point. <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's talk about some of the culture and care of hydrangeas, specifically the best situations for planting them as for, far as sh- shade to wet to sun and the soils. Yeah. So um the one that's the most popular by far is the big leaf hydrangea, the macrophylla with that big, what I call the elusive blue flower. Everybody wants that elusive blue flower. And I think what we do, um, we make the mistake, we give it too much shade. That Ideally, that plant will do very well uh, in part shade and almost full sun, depending on how far south you are. So um, up where we are here, and in fact, where they trial them up in Michigan, they have them out in the field, in the wide open field, in full sun all day long. They do not give them any shade and they do fine, but it's Michigan. You know, it's not, it's not further down, uh, down the coast. So uh, half a day, morning sun is ideal. Afternoon sun, you have to be really careful with because afternoon sun can really cook the living daylights out of it. But if you have the right amount of mulch um, and you have some moisture control and awareness of, of your soil composition, you should be able to have that plant do really well for you in a half a day of sun, whether it's morning or afternoon. The mulch is important. It needs a, a really rich soil, but it has to be well-drained. They don't like wet feet. Um, the big leaf hydrangeas will rot. 
And so one of the things that um, I, I talk about in my classes and in the book and in my blog is, you know, you'll come back, maybe your hydrangea is in the sun in the morning and you'll come back at two o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon and the plant is completely dehydrated and all the leaves are drooping and it looks terrible and it just breaks your heart, right? And all you want to do is go out and flood it with water. And what I recommend is that you don't do that because the hydrangea has a fabulous capacity to reach back into the adjoining soil once the sun is off it and bring the moisture back up and it rehydrates all on its own. So what I recommend is that you wait until the sun is off it for a few hours and go back out and check it. And then if it still doesn't recover, and you might even have to wait till the next morning, if it still doesn't recover, then you want to give it some water and you probably want to add some mulch to um, help it retain the moisture that you're going to give it. But don't flood it with water when you see that dehydrated plant. That's one way to kill it. You'll flood it with water, you deprive the oxygen, you deprive the roots of the oxygen that they need, you fill all the pockets up with water, and eventually the plant will rot. So that's the first one I think that we all have to do a little bit of a better job on, is just making sure that we have enough mulch. And, um, and I ask people to use their fingers, put your finger in the ground, you know, on the uh, next to the plant. And if it's dry up to the second knuckle, your plant is not going to do well. You have to give it so that it's moist up to the second knuckle of the finger that you stick in the ground. And you shouldn't be reluctant to do that. The same thing is true of the mountain hydrangeas, but they are a little bit more um, uh, resistant to the vagaries of the sun. They don't droop quite as quickly and quite as much, but the same rules pretty much apply to them. A half a day of sun, morning ideally, if not, then certainly afternoon, and then watch the moisture level. And those are the ones that are the most challenging for most gardeners. Um, because we, again, I think people classify it as a shade plant. It can do okay in the shade, but if you give it too much shade, you're not going to get many flowers from it. Um, and you're not going to be happy with your plant. It's never going to look as good as the day you brought it home. So soil fertility is one thing, and then the moisture level is another. In terms of soil fertility, the other thing people like to do is they like to throw fertilizer. They like to use 10-10-10, or they like to throw holly tone uh, indiscriminately on these plants. And I would suggest that that's not the best thing to do. Um, first of all, the um, 10, 10, 10 as a fertilizer is really not a recommended approach because no plant uses nutrients in equal amounts. And so when you use 10, 10, 10, what you're doing is you're really contributing to pollution and runoff. The plant can't use all the nutrients that you're throwing at it. And so it doesn't do much good for you, doesn't do much good for the plant, and doesn't do much good for the environment. Um, the best kind of fertilizer to use on all the shrubs actually happens to be rose food. You know, rose tone or any kind of shrub fertilizer will do really, really well for your plants and your plants will thrive with that. There's a, a good balance of nutrients. There's a lot of micronutrients in there that we don't even pay attention to that the plants really need to do very, very well on. So the fertilizing on um, the big leaves and all the other hydrangeas can be really simplified by just just getting bags of rose food and, and putting that out on, uh, I use the rose food on every single of my shrubs. I put it on the hydrangeas, on the spireas, on the viburnums. I mean, you name the shrub, it gets, it gets a dose of rose food um, every season and that's how I feed them. The holly tone, I think is good if you think you need to acidify your soil. And you don't know that unless you've done a soil test. And to some degree, that's a very easy thing to do. You can buy a little soil test kit in the garden centers, or you can send it away to your local extension service or to an independent laboratory. And, and you tell them what it is you're using it for, whether it's vegetables or landscaping, and they'll tell you what you need to add to get the soil where it needs to be so those plants do well in that environment. So the soil test is a good thing to do. Holly tone indiscriminately, I would tell you to hold off on until you know that you need to add the compounds that are in that, um, that formula to the plant that you're trying to feed to make it do something uh, it, maybe it hasn't done so far. You know, I learned a really good lesson when we got into COVID lockdown. All of my presentations were canceled like everybody's were. And so I wound up like everybody spending more time at home. And I actually had the time to devote to um, doing these fertilizing experiments and seeing what happened when I fertilized one set of plants and didn't fertilize the other set of plants. And sure enough, the ones that got the food were the ones that did much better in terms of flower production and general health. Um, they, didn't, they didn't succumb to the diseases and the insects that we normally see. And so that one little experiment that 
that I did convinced me that that fertilizing uh, early in the season, usually in the spring time frame, is really a good thing to do, especially when it comes to the big leaves and the mountain hydrangeas. Oak leaves, not so much um, because they are used to growing in, in um, uh, a woodland environment. You know, they're a good edge of the woods plant. They can take a fair amount of shade and still perform pretty well. So you don't have to worry about fertilizing, but what you want to make sure that you do is you treat them as if they were in their natural environment. So if you can throw leaves at their base, for example, that you might have collected from your last fall, that's a good way to mulch that plant because that is where they have naturally occurred. You know, that's a native. And so the native environment is usually in the woodlands. And the same is true for the woodland hydrangeas, the same kind of thing. You don't have to do much fertilizing there. But again, if you provide the same environment in which they have been, um, they've come from, which in the woodland case is the woodland, and that's another native, those plants will do pretty well without uh, putting too much energy and effort into fertilizing, as long as the soil isn't too terribly dry. Um, when you get over into the uh, panicle hydrangeas, they're the ones that absolutely love the sun. I think of I think of the panicle hydrangeas as the convertible of the cars, right? You, you, it's out on the sunny days and it looks great in the sun and it just loves the sun. And so the more sun you can give the panicles, the better flower production you're going to get, the better color you're going to get, and the plant's going to be really happy. But as we know, the sun's going to dry it out. So that's another thing that you have to just make sure that you've got enough mulch at the base so that it doesn't dry out. In a dry season, we're on a well here uh, where we live, and we have been for the whole time, 30-something years we've been here. So we don't have an irrigation system. So when we put the plants in, um, they get they get taken care of and they get watered on their first year. And then they get what I call tough love, and they have to make it. And if they don't make it, they either get donated or they wind up, you know, going in the compost pile because they died. But what you see on panicle hydrangeas is the flowers go brown really quickly in a dry season. They won't die on you, but you will lose the color really, really early. And so uh, in seasons where you don't have drought conditions and where you might get mid-season and late-season rains, those are going to keep the panicle hydrangeas in full color right up until you maybe get a frost. And that's when they're finally going to turn uh, turn into browns and beige kinds of colors. So, so the panicles are the sun lovers of the whole bunch. Um, the climbing hydrangeas, those are the ones that are the least fussy of all of them. They are fragrant. Uh, they are uh, prolific. They are vigorous. They take a long time to flower up. When I worked at the garden center, sometimes, not sometimes, frequently uh, in a season, I would get people come up to me and they'd say, you know, you sold me a climbing hydrangea, you know, three years ago and it hasn't bloomed yet. You know, they look at me like it's my fault, right? So I have to say, well, that's the way the plant is. It just takes a long time to get going. And then when it gets going, then you just stand back and you enjoy it because it just takes off. It's not as rampant as a wisteria, but it's close. It's close. And, and then it just produces flower after flower after flower with a fabulous fragrance. It doesn't need to be pruned. It doesn't need any kind of care and attention. And you even get some winter interest for it, from it because it has a nice exfoliating bark. So if you, that interests you, um, that could be something that, again, you add to your garden because it's a carefree plant as far as I'm concerned and can take a lot of shade and still do well. You put it, can put it on an arbor, you can put it up a tree, you can put it um, uh, on the ground. It makes a great ground cover, by the way. So if you want to hide an eyesore, a stump, or something um, that you, you think you don't want to look at anymore, put a climbing hydrangea down and just let it scamper along the ground. You won't get many flowers from it when it grows horizontal. It really likes to be vertical. But you get beautiful, glossy green foliage. You'll get a flower every now and then. And it will, it's a great ground cover. Nothing gets through it. No weeds, no nothing. It's just a fabulous ground cover. So, so that works really, really well um, under a variety of conditions um, and still produces for you. So um, we don't see many um, of the other hydrangeas up here. I, there are probably over 200 uh, that you can come across in any garden center. Like we don't see um, hydrangea aspera up here mm. be and that's got a fuzzy leaf and that's a little different, but it's really not hardy in our colder zones. So you probably see that more where you are, Kathy, than uh, where I am up here. Um, so the aspera is a little different. Um, they've changed the, the botanists, uh, the taxonomists and the botanists have been very busy and they've changed and put another 
several hydrangeas into the climbing category. There's one that's called Decumeria, which I haven't tried yet, uh, which is now part of the climbing hydrangea family. And they've put back in the Japanese uh, hydrangea vine, which technically is called Schizophragma hydrangeoides. What's wonderful about that one is it's pink. It's a pink flower all the time. Um, a little bit different shape to the flower, a little bit different shape to the foliage, but it has the same vigor that the traditional climbing hydrangea does. So when it comes to climbing hydrangeas now, you have options. You have this decomeria, you have the schizophragma in addition to the standard uh, climbing hydrangea, and they're all fabulous plants, I think. But I have to try the decumeria this year. Mm. And I, I love that you brought the, I call it the schizos, the, mm. the climbing hydrangeas. Uh, it is such a slow grower, but once it does get going, it's right. so beautiful and so yeah. worth it. And a great substitute to, you know, when you're pulling that English ivy off your big old growth trees, you know, yes. l lay up uh, one wand, I guess you would call it one branch of that climbing hydrangea mm -hmm. and just let it go. It's not yep. going to harm the trees at all. No, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. They, the way they climb, all of them, they don't. Um, they they use their own little tendrils, but they don't disturb mortar. For example, if you're cr climbing it up your fire your um, chimney, they don't disturb the mortar. They don't disturb anything, frankly. Um, it, when it comes to builders and landscapers, it's one of the few climbers that they don't have an objection to. Um, the only thing you're probably going to get from time to time, depending on the the structure that you're in, you might get some staining from it, you know, from the from the juices and all of that. But you don't get anything that's going to uh, be structurally a problem. Um, they really do very well against the house and against things like the chimney. But if you if you're putting it on against on a trellis, that trellis better be really strong and really mm -hmm. be able to withstand the weight of the plant because it really is a vigorous plant once it gets going. Yeah, I would say stone walls are better than wooden fence. <laughs> yes, right, right. Or trees. We we have them growing up the trees. You know, I have it growing up uh, some tulip trees and some maple trees. And the trees are, and they coexist and they're happy. They play really well with each other. Hmm. And so you use the term woodland hydrangea in one of your descriptions. And I think for us, we call it smooth hydrangea or hydrangea arborescence. Right. Right. That's the one. So, so, so that's the one where that's Annabelle, for example, which most of us have. She dates back to the 1940s. It was discovered. It's a native. So it was discovered in the woods. I think it was Iowa or Indiana, one of those states west of the Hudson River, <laughs> as I like to say. And so, um, so that's the one that most everybody has. And it's a very rugged plant. I mean, it can stand up to just about anything. It makes it through the winter. It's really hardy. Um, it blooms only on the growth that it puts on in the current year which makes it a winning plant because no amount of deer browse in the winter or winter weather or crazy pruning in the fall. You know, there's some people that just go out and prune everything in the fall. Um, and that's not going to hurt that plant at all. That plant will only flower on the new growth in the current season. But what the mistake is that a lot of people, and this is because of some stuff on the internet, which makes me crazy, is there's al always these recommendations to when you prune it, to prune it down to the ground, to the crown level. And I would tell you that that is the, probably the worst thing you can do for that plant because all those new stems that come up that are going to have those big flowers on them are not going to be strong enough to hold the weight of that flower. And that's why that plant, uh, the flowers fall over all the time. So my recommendation is if you feel you have to cut that plant back, what you want to do is take out every third stem and leave the others up around it at about two and a half or three feet. And that performs the job of a structure um, staking, if you will, so that the new flowers on those new stems that grow from the ground will have a support structure and hold them up. And so you don't take that plant down to the ground when you prune it, and, and then you just leave it alone. Um, if you were looking at Incrediballs, which is a, a, an arborescence, a newer one that's been into the marketplace, and you were looking at uh, Invincibels, which is a whole family of other arborescents that have come in, a lot of them are pink, which is a great color. Um, and they can take a lot more sun. Uh, they're a little bit smaller and the stems are a lot stronger on those. Um, we look at, we have a north facing garden uh, off the kitchen. 
And I look out on uh, two Incrediballs that I put in about four years ago, maybe five years ago, and they stand up to the winter weather. They they look great. The snow and the ice accumulate on them. The birds actually, we don't deadhead it. We let the birds uh, pick off them all winter long, which they do, because there's both male and female uh, organs within that flower head. And so um, a lot of times we get some volunteers in the garden after the birds have uh, done their done their duty, if you will. And so we leave all of the arborescence up. And that one on the north facing garden, which doesn't even get a full day of sun, does really, really well at about four and a half or five feet. And it just adds great color uh, in the evening when that when we have no light back there because it is the north side of the house. And so it's not a moon garden, but you do get the white of the flower, which is really quite lovely. Yeah, beautiful. And yeah, some of the white hydrangeas practically glow in right. that early evening. Just beautiful. And so you mentioned crazy pruning, Lorraine. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about some more sane pruning. What is right. your pruning advice for those different families of hydrangea? Well, the f- first thing is, um, if you have a, a big leaf hydrangea that is a rebloomer, all right, and this is and this is where it gets a little tricky because people say, well, I don't know what I have because I inherited the house. I first thing I can tell you is if your plant predates two thousand four, it is not a rebloomer because that's the first year that rebloomers were introduced into the marketplace, and that one that came out was Endless Summer. That was two thousand four. So if your plant predates 2004, you, 2004, you can rest assured that it is not a rebloomer. So what you, the way you're going to prune that plant is if you want to deadhead it to neaten it up, that's fine. But I would suggest that you leave the flowers on the plant for winter interest. If it's a part of, that, uh, of the garden that you don't look at all winter long, then leave it alone and then deadhead it come the spring. Otherwise, your pruning is going to be really easy because the, the stem that has given you the flower last year, is, is not going to give you a flower this year. There are stems that were grown last year that will give you the flower this year. So you don't want to cut a stem that didn't give you a flower. If you're looking at your plant, if the flower came last year, but now you have a bud at the top of your stem, don't cut it. Leave it alone because that's going to be your new flower in the current season. All right, the ones that predate 2004 flower this year on the growth that they put on last year. That's the old wood. And and by the way, hydrangeas aren't unique in this regard. Forsythias are the same way. Um, azaleas are the same way. Wygelas are the same way. There are many plants that will flower in the current season from the growth that they put on the previous season. So there's nothing you know that you can say, oh, this plant is different from every other. Well, it really isn't. Um, it blooms on old wood. Now, if you have a rebloomer, though, then I tell you, you don't want to cut it at all until you see the little heads of broccoli. They call it broccoli. It's what the bud looks like when it first comes out. And the reason for that is the rebloomer has a capacity to push out flowers from last year's growth, like the old wood, and push up flowers on new growth in the, in the current year. So when you take a pruner to it, before you see where your flower buds are coming from, you have a high probability of cutting off the flowers that you're going to get this year. When you deadhead that plant, if it's a rebloomer, when you deadhead that plant, what you do is you stimulate flower production along the length of the stem. Those buds along the length of the stem were set last year, and the only way they're going to come out is if you release the hormone that's holding them back. And you release that hormone by clipping off the flower on the tip of the plant. I did a pruning class last week at a botanical garden, New York Botanical Garden. It was a three hour class. And this is the piece that gets everybody confused about not touching your hydrangeas, your big leaf hydrangeas, until you see the little broccoli heads. Mm. And they say, well, it looks dead. This is my sister-in-law says that's just, well, it looks dead. And I said, well, if you think it's dead, what you want to do is you want to scratch it with your fingernail. And if it comes up brown, it's dead. If it comes up green, it's alive. If it comes up green, don't touch it. Walk away. And in fact, if, if your hydrangea macrophyllus, if your big leaf hydrangeas never saw a set of pruners, they'd be just fine. They'd be just fine. You could deadhead if you want to, to neaten it up, you know, once you're in the middle of the season. But if you never cut it, you're not going to dramatically um, negatively impact the plant at all, at all. Mm. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it if you don't want to. You can just walk away from it and enjoy the flowers when they come. But if you don't see broccoli, don't do anything until you get to that point. 
Well, I'm loving that advice, Lorraine, because um, <laughs> that is less work for all of us, right? right? So just laissez-faire, leave it alone. And if you're in doubt, leave it alone, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, this is the first year, the second year I'm in my house and I really want to work on my hydrangeas. And I say, well, think of something else to do <laughs> because you want to observe them first. You want to see what they do. You want to see how, what they look like. You want to see how they perform. Don't get in their way for the first couple of years. If you have a new plant or a new house or a new set of landscaping, let the plant do what it does. And then you can take your cue from the plant. So some people say, well, I don't know if my plant is a rebloomer. How do I know that? Well, the easy way to tell, and this is a great time of year to do that, is you go out and you look at your plants today, next week, before they put up their growth for the current year. And you look and you see if you have flowers coming from the side of a stem, that's a rebloomer. That flower was produced when the flower that was at the top of that stem was done and you cut it off or someone cut it off, right? And as a result, this, the buds that were sleeping in the stem, which they were all winter long, or maybe they were produced in the current year, those sleeping buds have now been released and they create that new flower that comes off the side of the stem. And that's how you know if your plant is a rebloomer. You just look and see where those flowers are coming from. The traditional non-rebloomers, the ones that predate 2004, most of the time they were called Nico Blues, all of those have their flowers only at the top of the plant, like little umbrellas all around the top of the plant. All the other ones that have flowers along the side are all rebloomers. And that's the easy way to figure that out. And if it's a rebloomer, then you want to wait until you see that broccoli before you make any cuts. All right. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to negatively impact the plant. What happens, a lot of people say, well, all right, now I know that this is a rebloomer, but I'm going to deadhead that plant now because it's April and it's 65 degrees and I want to go outside and I want to do something. To those people, I would say try not to do that because, again, in April and May, especially up where I am, we're not done with cold temperatures yet. We're not done with icy late season storms. And so if you cut that flower off the top of the reblooming stem, you've initiated the growth of the dormant bud and that bud is going to break dormancy and it's going to start emerging from the stem. And that's going to be a problem because what's going to happen on May 12th, maybe, or on April 19th, we're going to get a very cold night or we're going to get a late season ice storm. And that bud that you have released from that plant is now going to get frozen off or is going to get killed by the weather. And now you've just taken that second flush of flowers that the rebloomer could have given you and you have stopped it completely. And that's why you don't want to touch that plant until you can see the broccoli. And by the time you see broccoli, your weather issues are all finished. They're completely gone. And that's the other saving grace. So you just look for that and you know that the timing on the plant is telling you, okay, you can go ahead now and you can intervene if you want to and clean me up, take out some of my old growth if you want to, do some of those other kinds of things. But just wait until you see those little heads of buds coming through. <laughs> so now I'm only going to pitch a broccoli every time I think about hydrangea. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So um, I know the other big question uh, right after pruning is that color changing uh, phenomenon that hydrangea seems to be a unique plant in our garden to do. Right. So uh, first thing you do is a soil test because the what you're trying to do to create, if you want the blue flower, uh, you have to have uh, the aluminum in the plant has to be able to move up to the stem where the flower is going to be produced. And that's only going to happen with a particular pH reading. And so the blue flowers are going to come if the pH is in uh, 6 to 4.5 to 6.0. And so, and people have to remember that pH is not an absolute scale, it's a logarithmic scale. So it's really times 10. So you don't go from 4.5 to 5, you know, that's not a, just a quick, you know, snap of the fingers. That's a, a bigger jump than just 4.5 to 5 because it's times 10. So the first thing you would do is you would do a soil test and you see what the soil, what the reading is, what your pH is, where your plant is. And then you can apply either aluminum sulfate if you want to make it blue to bring the pH down, or you're going to use a lime 
uh, uh, pelletize lime in most cases to uh, bring the pH up into the eight category, which is where you're going to get pink color flowers. Now, the other thing to remember, though, is this is not one and done. Soil is always going to want to revert back to its normal state. And so you can do it for this season. And by the way, you don't do it now for this season. You should have been doing it last fall for the current season, right? It takes a while for that nutrient uh, to get taken into the plant. So you have to give it some time to do that over the course of the winter. But when you're done, you're not done. It's not one and done. You're going to have to do it consistently over time. You're going to have to consistently test and consistently amend uh, to make that pH what you want it to do. And you can be undermining your own efforts. And let me give you a couple of examples. If you have hydrangeas that flank the lawn, right? A lot of us use it as border plants, right? We have this lovely lawn and then on the sides we have hydrangeas, right? And the lawn maybe has a little bit of a slope to it and maybe the lawn gets fertilized and that fertilizer for the lawn is very high in nitrogen. And what that nitrogen does, as wonderful as it is, it produces lots of green leaves. And so if you have a plant that flanks the lawn and you haven't been getting many flowers from it, you might have been giving it the wrong thing because it's getting a lot of nitrogen and it's not paying attention to anything else that you're doing for it. So even though you might be amending to get the color change on it, if, you've, if it's adjacent to the lawn, uh, you're going to defeat your own purpose. The other thing that happens with color is that uh, if you have the hydrangeas in the front, let's say at the foundation of the house and the foundation, you have a nice cement foundation or you might have a nice cement walk, that's leaching into the soil. All of, those, uh, all of those chemicals and all of those minerals from the foundation and from the cement walk. And that eventually was going to go back and make the soil more limey and it's going to create more of a pink color. So if you're trying to take those front foundation plants and make them blue, you're gonna have a harder time because of just where that plant is put next to the foundation or the cement walk. Those kinds of things happen. And especially it happens if we have a rainy summer because all of that water comes and leaches all of that lime back into the soil and that will change the color of your flower without you doing anything. So flower color, um, what I try to help people do is accept the one that they've they got and, and learn to love it. Um, when you buy them in the garden centers, they have been bred to be blue because everybody wants the blue flower. And over time, that flower is going to uh, come out in the color that is most consistent with the soil chemistry where it's planted. And that's what you have to be aware of. Not an easy thing. Mm. Yeah. And it's that's you painted me perfectly, Lorraine. I have <laughs> bright pink or to pale lavender. Um, and I want that blue, blue, blue. But yes, I have a brick house. So it's in a you know yeah. large driveway. So with concrete driveway, it's always going to go to pink on me. Exactly. Um, and I always tell people, if you care about the color, buy white. <laughs> <laughs> and you're always going to have a white hydrangea. Like if you want it, the right. color that you bought it with, right. buy the white ones and, and they'll stick that way. The, the other option, uh, it, and, and it's, not a great, it's not a great strategy, but there are some of the big leaf hydrangeas now that have been bred to be more blue. You know, there's one that's called Blue Jangles. There's another one called uh, Blue Daddy. Uh, you know, there are several that have the word blue in their name. And if they have the word blue in their name, they have a higher propensity to lean toward blue. But uh, all of those factors of being next to the foundation and a cement walk and a cement driveway uh, will eventually overcome that capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have blue jeans. Yep. Like like the jeans you wear. And that's, I would call that a light lavender at best right now, right, but right. it's my bluest of all of them. So right. I do at least enjoy that one in my purple garden. <laughs> so in our last few minutes, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I might be throwing you a curveball with this one. So we're talking about zonal envy and your envy of our warm climate. Mm -hmm. We're envy of your cool nights up there because <laughs> I have heard anecdotally that the big hydrangea, those huge, you know, basketball size blooms, we're never going to get those here in the mid-Atlantic with our hot, humid summers because our nights don't cool down enough right. to let the plants rest and send that energy into that big flower production that you get in those big Michigan blooms. Yeah, that is, I, I believe that to be an, a scientific fact. Um, 
So I, I, I would trade off my big blooms for the, for the hardiness, Kathy. I would, I would take the hardiness before I would take the big blooms because even, even if when the flat, when the, when the flowers are large, they're really stunning and they're impressive. But the fact is many of them still are not on stems that are strong enough to keep them vertical. Um, and, and the newer ones, if you look at the uh, oak leaf hydrangea, for example, you look at something like Gatsby Moon, has a very, very dense flower head. I mean, the flower head is just knock your socks off. It's very, very dense. But the first time we get any kind of rain, it just takes the whole plant down because there's the stems just can't get, can't be strong enough to hold the weights of those flowers. Mm. So I would, I would prefer to have a smaller flower that's going to uh, stand up better to the weather when we get those rainstorms, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and sacrifice the, the coloration and all of that. I just, the size isn't, I guess it's an individual preference. Size isn't mm -hmm. that important to me. I thought you were going to say size isn't everything. <laughs> That's right. Close enough. Close, Close enough. enough. Um, but true. And we could always vacation in each other's areas in the right. summer. And right. I get to go up to the Cape or to exactly. The, exactly. the Great Lakes and see the big blooms up there. Right. And then you guys can come and see the prolific blooms down here, but smaller. Well, um, it's not just that. You get plants there that we, we can't even touch. I mean, you can grow one called uh, Matilda Goodguess. Mm. Um, and Matilda is practically deep purple. She's such a deep blue. She's gorgeous. But I can't, I can't get a flower out of her up here. Um, there's another one um, called Lemon, Lemon Daddy. Right. Mm. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a sport of big daddy with beautiful oh, yeah. golden foliage, the, but it doesn't flower for me. I can't get it to flower. So yeah. Zone mm. envy. <laughs> yes. Zonal envy across the world. Uh, so in our last few minutes, uh, first one to ask you about some of your favorite cultivars uh, that you grow. And then we can end with a little discussion about the best ones for drying and the best time. Um, if you want some really beautiful dried hydrangea blooms, should you be cutting those at their peak, right before their peak, or what's the best for that? Well, let's. Um, in terms of in terms of a favorite, I I have a real hard time with that question because um, I have different favorites for different situations. I mean, I, I tough stuff, for example, I think is a fabulous um, hydrangea. It's a hydrangea serrata. It's a mountain hydrangea. It's a wonderful lace cap flower. The bees are all over it. So if I want a great pollinator plant that's going to be really uh, resistant to all the weather and all the stuff that Mother Nature throws at us, I would tell you Tough Stuff, I think, really does it. And there are about four or five different versions now of Tough Stuff. There's Tough Stuff, aha. There's Tiny Tough Stuff. There's Red Tough Stuff. So you can get in a variety of colors and sizes, by the way, some as small as 18 inches. So so I think Tough Stuff can really uh, stand up. Again, my requirement is about reblooming and about weather resistance. So that's one of my strong favorites. The other one that I really like is um, is Lady in Red, which is a, a large uh, big leaf hydrangea. It comes from the mountains of Japan, but it still carries the macrophylla tag to it. They've not uh, reclassified that into the serrata category. Hmm. It's a fairly sizable plant, has beautiful red stems. It's it's one of the plants that was used in the breeding of Twist and Shout to get the red stems. It's used in a lot of breeding programs because of its resistance to the weather and the red stem and the beautiful flower and the prolific and blah, 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 blah. It's a, so Lady in Red, I would tell you, but it's going to be hard to get. You probably have to go to a hydrangea specialty nursery or have your garden center order it for you from a hydrangea specialty nursery. Um, the newer ones are coming up so much better than the older ones. So when I have to give up a plant because I'm not liking what it's doing, the newer ones are just better for stem strength. Um, I got the can, uh, hydrangea can do was a trial I got about three years ago. That one produced flowers in its very first year. It has produced flowers in year two and year three, despite the weather, despite the dry conditions it has, um, the tough love that we gave it on year two and year three. So that's another one that I think is really going to go down as, as being one of the most of the best plants around. Um, when you look at the uh, panicle hydrangeas, those, it's again, the newer ones are so much better because they have stronger stems on them and they're holding the plant up. So you might have liked vanilla strawberry or you might have liked um, uh, firelight and some of the others, but the newer ones are coming in even better now. So, so I don't have a favorite on that one yet because the new ones, I'm testing them like crazy. And I think that they're going to uh, perform much better than the older ones. Um, 
and I, I told you I love climbing hydrangeas. I think they're really superb. They really are. What was the second part of your question, Kathy? Oh yeah, I gave you too much at once. Uh, let me break. <laughs> let me break that up a little. I was asking about when is the best time for getting beautifully preserved dried flower heads. Yeah. So um, uh, there's a couple things. First of all, the big leaf hydrangeas on a season that is not terribly dry. As they age, they morph into a variety of colors. Um, it's called antique season. And I actually did a post on that with all the colors the plants were producing in one season. It was just it was just blowing my mind. So the blues goes to lavenders. They go to pinks. One of them will go and have three or four colors. So if you want to get multiple colors on your flower before you use it for a dried arrangement, I would tell you uh, make sure it gets plenty of irrigation because the dry can, a, a dry condition can really change the probability for that. And then cut them when they are morphing into those other colors. I mean, that's when you want to, that's when you want to go after them. The other ones, I would say you cut them when they are the absolute freshest, but you have to condition them a little bit, you know, so you cut them uh, in the morning, first of all, uh, then you will um, condition them and keep them in a cold place for about, uh, for half a day, probably before you put them in any kind of a vase. You might have to rehydrate them. You might have to stick them in a, a bucket of water and literally give them a bath and let them sit there and they'll rehydrate all on their own. And then you just let them dry naturally. Uh, after you have rehydrated them and you can you can tie them up and, and just hang them upside down like you would garlic, you know, when you're curing garlic at the end of the season, or you can leave them in the vase, uh, again, with no water and they will dry um, all on their own. But you have to capture them with the color that you want uh, before you uh, do anything else to them. Hmm, wonderful. And I do know people who make it a hobby of dying their dried <laughs> hydrangeas. And bringing back some of the colors because maybe they don't like that kind of antique beige look. Mm, no, I can say it's personal preference. I've never used it. I haven't painted them. I just, I think paint is like, cause like a heavy thing. I've never tried that. I don't mm. know how that would work. Yeah, there are floral sprays that are a little lighter. Yeah, a little lighter, um, right. Mm -hmm. Right. But yes, yeah. Well, that's what... It that's what they do in the poinsettias when you go in and the Christmas time and they make all those awful color poinsettias, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> similarly, similarly. Oof. Yeah. And they throw a little glitter on there too. And which you could do with your hydrangeas as well, but I was going to say to each their own, mm -hmm. um, as you would like to do. So this was fascinating, uh, Lorraine, and we learned so much about hydrangea care and choices and some of those new breeding and trials that are going on we're going to have to definitely have you come back in a couple of years to talk about all the new new introductions because yeah, the new, there new are ones. so many coming down the pike right there are there are mm -hmm. i i i can say i have to rotate them out of the garden because i just don't have enough space <laughs> so any final thoughts for our listeners on growing hydrangeas i would tell you to just enjoy them don't interfere with them let them do what they do on their own and try not to do the stuff that you read on the internet. Oh my God, the stuff on the internet makes me crazy about cutting them down to the ground, um, about how you're going to fertilize them. I mean, all the things we talked about. There's so much bad information online that it's really stunning. Hmm. Yeah, I would say the best decision would be laissez-faire, right? Mm -hmm. You know, leave yep. it alone unless you have to. And then to consult your book. So let's give our listeners that book title again and how they can contact and learn more from you. Yep. Thank you for that. So the book is called Success with Hydrangeas, A Gardener's Guide. It's available uh, on Amazon, of course, right? What isn't? Uh, through my website, you can get a signed copy if you wanted to or an inscribed copy, uh, which is always available. And I'd be more than glad to accommodate you on that. I also write a free hydrangea blog. I've been writing it now for about five years. You can sign up for it or you can just get on my website, which is LorraineBellotto.com. Across the top, you'll see Lorraine Bellotto's hydrangea blog. If you just click on that, up will come uh, the search bar as well as the most recent blog postings. And you can search in the search bar for just about all the things we talked about today, as well as a bazillion others because it's been, you know, 65 or more than that, probably 85 posts over the course of the five years. And you'll be able to pull up information that will expand a lot on what we talked about today with photographs. And that might, find, that might be helpful for you to answer your question and get some guidance. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Okay, Kathy, thank you. Want to make your own podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily 
then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I feel like I have more options and with Q&A and polls, it lets me be more creative with the Garden DC podcast. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. St. John's Wort Plant Profile St. John's wort, Hypericum species, is a dense mounding shrub or woody perennial plant, often used as a ground cover. It has large, bright yellow flowers that bloom in summer. It prefers to grow in fertile, well-drained soils in full sun to part shade. It is hardy to zones 4 to 8. It is deer-resistant and also drought-tolerant once established. You can prune them in late summer after flowering to neaten up their appearance. St. John's wort can be used as a low border or informal hedge. They are often planted on slopes for erosion control. The common St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, came over from Europe with a colonist and is prized for its medicinal uses. It gets its common name from St. John the Baptist, whose saint's day is June 24th, which is the traditional date to harvest the flowers. Other common names for it include goatweed, devil's scourge, and God's wonder plant, among many others. The shrubby St. John's wort, Hypericum prolificum, is native to the mid-Atlantic region and eastern half of the United States. It prefers rocky soils, but is clay tolerant. The calm St. John's wort, Hypericum calmianum, is native to the Great Lakes region. It grows to about three feet high. The golden St. John's wort cultivar sunburst, Hypericum frondosum, is native to the American South. It grows to about four feet high and is more heat tolerant than other varieties, but is more susceptible to root rot when planted in damp soils. St. John's wort, you can grow that. What's new this week in the garden? Well, my grape hyacinth, the little muscari, are just poking up and starting to bloom, looking beautiful. I have been visiting several local public gardens in the Washington DC region this past week to see that spring has sprung at many of them. Those beautiful gardens include Dumbarton Oaks, Brookside Gardens, and the Francisca Monastery. I highly encourage you to stop by one or more of them and check out the photos I posted on our Instagram at WDC Gardener. One of those local public gardens, which is looking very spectacular right now, is Tudor Place, and that is hosting a spring garden party that you might want to put on your upcoming events calendar. That is Wednesday, May 24th from 6 to 9 p.m., and you can purchase tickets at tudorplace.org. Coming up more quickly, is the weekend of April 1st and 2nd. Two events I wanted to call your attention to. One is the White House Spring Garden Tour. Uh, This is free and open to anybody, but they are time tickets that will be distributed at the National Park Service tent located at the White House Visitor Center on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, It's first come, first served, so only one ticket per person. You can find out more details about that at whitehouse.gov. Another event that same weekend of April 1st and 2nd that you might be interested in is the Gloucester County Daffodil Festival that includes tours of 
gardens and information from the Gloucester County Master Gardeners. And this is in the Tidewater, Virginia area. You can find out more about that from BrentandBeckysBulbs.com. And then finally, our friend of the podcast, Martha Pindale, has asked me to share some information with you. She says, if you're considering a career in horticulture and don't know where to start, the American Landscape Institute Scholarship Program might be for you. If you live in D.C. or the Baltimore metro region, this two-year Earn and Learn program will pair you with a nursery or landscape employer who will provide 80% tuition scholarship towards horticultural classes at the Community College of Baltimore County in Dundalk, Maryland. For more information about the program, visit the website AmericanLandscapeInstitute.com and you can email Martha at info at AmericanLandscapeInstitute.com with any questions. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. Good day, everyone. This is Dr. Alan Armitage, a.k.a. Dr. A, with the last word in the garden. I've been sharing a few of these with you, and today I want to give you my take on my last word on hydrangeas. Now, hydrangeas are kind of, to me, like euchras, echinaceas, hollies. There's just way too many of them. That doesn't mean they aren't spectacular. There's a lot of hydrangeas that people just can't get enough of. Now look at these mop head things. This is hydrangea macrophylla, if you like. The mop heads, your grandmother's hydrangeas in blues and pinks. Spectacular. Where they're spectacular. Now I want to tell you, for me, this is the hardest hydrangea there is to grow. And I just don't get it. Now... I love these hydrangeas in Seattle and Vancouver. I love them in the upper Midwest. I love them where, you know, things are good. Uh, Climate is, you know, it's winter's pretty hard, but the rest is not too bad. But oh my goodness, hydrangeas mean hydro, water. They need a ton of water. I don't care where they are. 
If they're too much shade, they don't flower well. If it's too much sun, they wilt all day. And oh my, don't tell me about late frosts. They get killed, creamed, otherwise destroyed, just when they're starting to look good. Now you can tell I am not a mop head fan, but bring me those panicle hydrangeas and I am in seventh heaven. Thank goodness those things started to be bred and available to us gardeners because now they still need some shade, but they take a whole lot more light. They still need water, but they don't need nearly as much. They still get a burnt up a, a real bad late frost, but heck, compared to the mop heads, these things are indestructible. Now, they're a little boring. The flowers are only white, and of course they turn pink or turn this, but I love them. I love them because I'm successful with them. Now, maybe just where I live, I'm in a warmer part of the country than many of you, but nevertheless, I don't want to see another mop head, and I, that's all I ever see, and that's all I ever hear about, and good for you, and good for them, and good for the breeders, and hope everybody's making hay with mop head hydrangeas. Give me the panicle types and don't even get me started about how fabulous oak leaf hydrangeas are and many of the other types that we have in front of us. I love hydrangeas. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I don't love hydrangeas. I, I admire all the breeding of hydrangeas. I think they're spectacular. That's why I go visit other gardens. So we have the mop heads, the panicle types, the oak leaves. Everybody have a ball. Let's go garden. That's my last word on hydrangeas. A bit tongue-in-cheek, as they say, a bit cheeky. But, hey, that's what gardening is all about. Have fun. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.